And if Trump comes back, people yeah. will start to think, well, and, do you know what? That's the way to and, behave. And just to remind people, Trump is doing better and better. And the things that are really going to be worrying Biden are that African-American voters look as though they're turning against Biden. If there's a shift from even 10% voting for Trump to 20% voting for Trump, which seems plausible, that's going to have a huge impact. Welcome to The Rest is Politics Question Time with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And Alistair's just as usual. I was hoping to have an advantage over him because he got, you got literally zero hours sleep last night. So Pretty I, thought, much, I yeah. thought I could trick you, but actually you just caught me out when I thought we were on leading, which is a good chance to promote leading. Leading is a separate feed that we do. And what happens in it? We interview people. Uh -huh. Usually individuals, former presidents, current prime ministers. Sometimes some interesting pairings. Sometimes we have pairings. The two Andes, we for example. We have two Andes, Burnham, who was, I thought, fascinating at the COVID inquiry this week, as was Sadiq Khan, in basically saying that the government had not kept the devolved administrations in, in uh, contact with the reality. Uh, we've done lots in Ireland. We've done lots Amazing of Amazing heads of Middle state. East. We've had great entertainment stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a bit more than an entertainment star. No, of course, it's, of course, of course, of course, yeah. governor of California. I'm saying we've had a, yeah. we've had the occasional sportsman, occasional sportsman, yes, and they're they're quite timeless actually in a way that maybe some of our other feeds are more. Uh, yeah, I think even the ladies. even the ones we've done recently on the Middle East, I hope will stand the test of time, because although we talk about what's happening now. I think we're trying to get people who really know about the history and about the, the kind of geopolitical consequences of what's going on, but but set very much in that context of the past as well as the future. So anyway, wherever you get your podcast, check out Rest is Politics Leading, and you'll find already, I don't know how many we've done, several dozen. Yeah. So first question, Rory. Sarah Jane Blakemore, who is a neuroscientist, and she's written this. Reading the terrible news about the four boys who died in Wales last weekend made me think about how policy could be changed around allowing young drivers to carry passengers in the car with them. For 20 years, we've been doing research on brain development in adolescent with a particular focus on peer influence and risk taking. And it shows adolescents take more risks when with peers. Now, we don't know that's what happened here, but this is her point. In the context of driving, more passengers in the car makes young drivers more likely to crash. Canada and Australia have laws restricting the number of passengers young people can take in the car for a number of months and years after passing their test. Has something similar been considered in the UK? Big, big shout out to Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's an amazing British scientist who's been doing research, both, um, I think, research with uh, social studies, but also neuroimaging on adolescent brains. She's written a fantastic book for anybody who's got a teenager called Inventing Ourselves, Secrets of the Teenage Brain. And she has discovered just how dramatically when you become a teenager, when you enter adolescence, your brain begins to change in terms of actually the composition of different cells in the brain and continues evolving till you're 25. So firstly, I think take very seriously the fact that she is absolutely right on risk taking. And she's absolutely right, regardless of what the details of what happened in, in, in Wales were, which is a very, very sad tragedy. But and, and that may well have some other explanation. But the general point is absolutely right. Young people, particularly, it seems, young men, take a lot more risk when there are other people with them, which is why uh, in some countries you have limits on taking passengers shortly after you've passed your test. And I'd like very much to see this in Britain. Mm. I mean, listen, when I was, I got my, I uh, passed my driving test in Creef um, in Scotland. And in those days, there was no traffic light in Creef. There was no roundabout in Creef. Um, so when I first drove my mother into Edinburgh, I think she, she, she uh, almost died, not just from the traffic, but from a heart attack. But I definitely feel I should, I was very, very, very dangerous. I'm very relieved that I made it through those years without crashing. Well, how many times did it take you to pass your test? I passed the first time. Did you? Yeah, which is which is bad. Yeah, I, th I think I fell five. Right. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, probably your better driver as a result. I'm not sure I am. Lessons. I had this. I had this. Um, my knee started twitching as soon as I got into the car. It was a real sort of nervous thing, and so I couldn't. I couldn't use the clutch because my knee was just was twitching too much. Twitching too much. Yeah. 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 I also was. I, I also at one point in the test. I think it was my third test. The, the guy pointed out gently that I was driving over the speed limit. So I, 
I said, should we just stop now? He said, well, we might as well. <laughs> now, here's one. Guy Blasky. Yes. Will a political party ever talk about the benefits of migration? Well, 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 well. Um, I think it's unlikely you'll get many people talking about it at the moment because immigration is probably the single biggest political factor in elections in Europe and North America at the moment. I mean, it's it's um, if you look at Biden's challenges, yes, it's against Trump. Yes, it's cost of living, but a lot of it is around immigration. If you look at the populist parties in Europe, migration is absolutely at the center of the way they're making their uh, their progress. And therefore, I think it's very unlikely you'll see liberal conservatives talking about the benefits of migration. There are, of course, huge benefits. I mean, the most obvious one being that our welfare state is very, very dependent on getting young people in because we're aging quickly um, and we've got fewer and fewer working people to support the elderly. But getting parties to talk about it is another thing. Tell us about migration in general, Asa. You've been looking a bit at migration figures recently. Well, we had the net migration figures last week and they're at, they're at record levels. 745,000 people, more people came than left. And, it's, and that's net, isn't it? Because it's 1.2 exactly. million. Exactly, 1.2 million. Yeah. So 1.2 million came, the rest, some, some left. left. Yeah. A lot of them European Union citizens post-Brexit. Um, and in, interestingly, so, so we've, we've created these massive gaps in the labour market. And so I don't know whether the people who voted for Brexit will be pleased or not at 1.2 million immigrants coming in, one in five of them from India, uh, 141,000 from Nigeria, 89,000 from China. I'm thinking the Chinese probably mostly in students. Other population, other um, countries that are, that are providing people, as you say, frankly, to, to fill the public services. And, you know, I, I think if you're working, I, I've had in the last few days, I've had to go to hospital twice as a visitor. And you notice two things. One, they cannot operate without immigrants. And secondly, it feels really, really, really pressured. Way more pressured than I've ever known it before. Uh, and they're also, all saying the same thing. Although you had an extraordinary figure on the last podcast on how much the government is now spending on health and social Absolutely, care and how yeah. much it will continue to spend. Exactly. And so the, the point is... G going up, you said about 42% of the government. 45% by 2028. Of the government budget. Yeah, yeah of, the, of, of overall public yeah, spending. Yeah. So... If you have these huge demand on public services, particularly for older people and the care homes, I mean, I think if you again, if you go into a care home, you, you sort of feel the stresses that they're under. You talk to people who are working there; they say that they, they quotes can't find the staff. So where are they going to get them? We're having to go abroad, and of course, as we get older, we're going to need more people looking after us. Where are they going to come from? And, and one of the challenges in this, again. Uh, is, is, I think, the, the central question for any government, which is what type of migration they're targeting. Yeah. Because part of the government is thinking, we want to bring in highly skilled software engineers, tech engineers to transform productivity in Britain and grow the economy. But of course, a lot of what actually is required are lower skilled people, you know, people to help pick fruit, people to help work in care homes, people to help clean in hospitals, et cetera. And so, a lot of these people were from the, prior to Brexit, were from the European, European Union. So we're also seeing, with 1.2 million people coming in, um, a very significant change over time um, to the multicultural nature of Britain. I mean, we talk about multiculturalism in Britain. Britain is going to become more and more multicultural. Mm, absolutely. Um, Cairo Beck, what are you reading at the moment? And what has been your favourite book that you've read this year? Favourite book I've mentioned before, Jim Down. Life in the Balance, uh, Intensive Care Doctor. I'm reading a book at the moment which has got a beautiful title, Wie wir wurden, was wir sind. Now, I'm ashamed to say I can't remember the name of the author, but don't you think that's beautiful? Well, kind of, Wie wir wurden, was wir sind, eine kurze Geschichte. Very good. How we became what we are. Does it sound the same in English? No. no. Wie wir wurden, was wir sind. Yeah, that's very, that's very good. Very good. I, you'd have to think very hard how you produce the same alliteration in, in English. So um, what are you reading? I'm reading a book called In Love with the World by Yungay Mingyur Rinpoche. So he is a, he is uh, a, uh, I guess, Tibetan Nepali abbot 
and Rinpoche, so he's a reincarnated lama, who chose to leave his monastery and go and basically live homeless on the Indian streets. So, and, and it's very interesting. Oh, was he in love with the world? It's called In Love with in the love World. In Love with the World. And so his life had been very, very sheltered. His father had been a sort of uh, abbot and reincarnated lama. He'd grown up as a little princeling, and then he decides to go and essentially live homeless. And living homeless in India is, is pretty extreme. So for the next three years of his life, he lives in situations of very extreme grinding poverty, comes very close to dying on a number of occasions, and has to apply his Buddhism in the most extreme conditions imaginable. So highly, highly recommended. It. It's a very um, joyful book. It's a very inspiring book. Um, and it's an astonishing personal story. Excellent. Uh, Elaine, German budget. What's going on with the German budget? Why hasn't it got much international coverage? Go on, tell us about German budget. Well, I'm really surprised this hasn't got more coverage because it's massive. And it's, in fact, we're recording this on Tuesday. Uh, it's 10.30. And in half an hour's time, if I'm right, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, will be in the Parliament trying to explain what the hell is going on. Um, if I can give a plug to Tanit Koch, who used to be the editor of Bild Zeitung and now writes a column in The New European. She's done a really, really good piece about this. Essentially what happened is that the... See, we don't have uh, a written constitution. The Germans have a something called the Bundesverfassungsgericht, which is the, constitu the federal constitutional court. And they have called out the coalition for relocating 60 billion euros worth of credit that they were allowed to spend because of emergency relief during the pandemic that they've now tried to put into the climate and transformation budget. And the Constitutional Court has decided they can't do this. And it's absolutely taken the coalition government, the SDP, the Greens and the, F and the FDP, it's taken them right back to the beginning because they just don't have this money now. And the FDP are quite happy with that because they're sort of fiscally quite conservative. But the Greens, of course, want to, they want to get rid of the, can I give you another word? The Schuldenbremse, which is the debt break. Okay. Uh, they want to get rid of that so they can borrow more money. So what would happen to this money if, if the Constitutional Court doesn't allow them to spend it? Well, that, that's what Schultz is going to have to try to address today. Um, but he basically has said, we're going to have to accept the judgment. And the so judgment they got, means they've got to give the money back. The judgment means they cannot spend that money on the things that they want to spend. Without on. a vote from Parliament, presumably. Without, well, I, I think even that, it's an absolute clear ruling that this was in defiance of their own constitutional arrangements. So as, as Elaine says, it is. I find it bizarre that Germany is still, you know, a pretty big economy, even though it's not doing as well as it might be. And yet, you know, had you read about it? I hadn't. And, and the German economy is the biggest news, of course, in Europe and uh, biggest news in many, many ways. I mean, it, it, partly because it's really struggling, as you say, it's it's teetering on the edge of technical recession. And I think I, I do want to talk about German economy a bit because the during the days of Cameron, Osborne austerity, it was always the German economy was the alternative to the kind of neoliberal austerity. There were meant to be two ways of running an economy. The sort of British neoliberal way, which was all about financial services and low taxes and this and the other. And Germany, which was meant to be more about bigger tax burden, more investment in vocational training, bigger manufacturing base. And Germany seemed very, very successful during that period, which led a lot of economists, and this will include people advising the Labour Party, to say, well, we should be more like the Germans, right? The problem now is that the German model seems to be in real trouble because it feels as though a lot of their industrial investment, a lot of their export bets, a lot of their investment, for example, in pharmaceuticals, the car industry is now beginning to go wrong. And they may not have the flexibility that the British economy has to adjust, which is a real challenge when we think about what a different economic strategy could be. Matt McQueen. Yeah. Why do successive governments prior prioritise chasing benefit fraud rather than tax fraud when one of these is a far bigger problem than the other? Ah, well, what do you think the answer to that is? I'm asking you, Rory. What do you well, think the answer is? Well, I guess the, I guess the beginning of that is that, um, I mean, yes, governments do chase tax fraud. And you'll see every government endlessly standing up very optimistically. Labour Conservative always in their budgets say, we're going to get much more money by chasing tax fraud. And 
I think sometimes they're successful. I mean, they do close tax loopholes. I think George Osborne claimed to bring in quite a lot of money from chasing it. Benefits fraud is is another issue. I mean, I think the, the problem with benefits is that either you're try to be strict, in which case very unfairly people who should be getting support don't get support, or you veer on the generous side and a few people who maybe shouldn't get support do get support. You And I think one thing that's certain is governments never get it exactly right. And that leaves the suspicion that some people are getting benefits who don't deserve to get benefits. And I guess that is always going to be something that's politically a hot topic. I remember, I mean, even, even when you were in government, you also made moves on trying to cut down on benefit fraud, right? Oh, yeah. But, but, but I, I look, Gordon Brown, when he was chancellor, was constantly trying to raise more money through shutting down tax loopholes. Yeah. Um, I think the answer to the question, though, is that it's an easy issue around which to do, dare I say, populist polarizing politics. You know, it's, it's about the, the kind of richer off there and, well, they do what they do. But if you can get some poor people over there and we can sort of look down on them and, and basically think they're the ones ripping us off, I think it helps the populace. Richard Kumar, where does all the money go? If the tax burden is so high, why are key public services like health and education underfunded? Where does the money go? Well, a lot of it at the moment goes on paying debt. Um, look, we, we, we have had uh, low growth, low productivity, and a couple of emergencies, including COVID and, and the war in Ukraine. But essentially, I think if you've had sclerotic growth, stagnating wages over an extended period of time, we're having to spend more money on paying down debt, and we're having to spend more money to keep public services running at a minimum. But the fundamental truth is that Britain um, isn't as wealthy as it sometimes likes to think. It doesn't actually, its tax burden is high historically, but it's not as high as it is in places like France or Germany. And health and education get an incredible amount of money, but because of the way they work, we're still not getting the results that the public want. And and Alice has pointed out that we're about to end up in a world in which health and social services are going to consume 45% of our budget, you know, hundreds of billions of pounds a year. And it, it's something that isn't talked about in this political debate, that Theresa May put another 300 million a week into health. Boris Johnson put more into health. Rishi Sunak put more into health. But the truth is, everyone can see that waiting lists are going up. And health inflation is much higher than normal inflation. In other words, the costs of running health services are higher than normal inflation because people are getting older all the time. They're living longer. Drugs are more expensive. So, Also, in the autumn statement, Roy, um, if you look in the figures, Jeremy Hunt is actually putting more money into the health service this year, but then the increase is slow. And it's interesting how he didn't, he didn't make a thing about putting more money into health at all. So, I, I mean, they know that they're going to have the pressures are going to rise and rise and rise and rise. My worry, of course, is that the there is a pretty well organised uh, debate going on on the right of British politics, which essentially is saying the health service is not fit for purpose. We've got to get a new model. And the truth is probably, and not probably, definitely somewhere in between, which is that we desperately need reform. That we are not going to be able to afford to keep endlessly increasing health spending without some reforms the way the NHS works, the way productivity works. And this was something that New Labour was quite bold on. One of my favourite interviews on leading is with a wonderful Labour health secretary who was very radical. I saw him I saw him at the weekend, by the way. Go on. And he he he, he can't get over how much you love him. Well, I think it's he, a, he was saying to me, I can't get over how much Rory loves me. Everywhere I go, people say, you know, Rory Stewart really loves you. Well, if anyone listens to that leading interview, um, what you can see there is that at that point, Labour was much more confident about talking about reform to public services, much more confident about saying, yes, we're going to put more money in, but the price of putting more money in is we're going to really change the way they work. Mm. That was about setting up foundation trusts. That was about thinking about which bits the market could help in. He wasn't an anti-market fundamentalist. And I think it, we're going to be in real trouble in Britain if we don't recognise that there is this train coming down the track where we're going to end up spending so much money without actually delivering the services that people want, without reform. 
Now, Roy, you read a lot of books. Yes. Mark Lynch wants to know, it's coming up to Christmas, would Charles Dickens have voted Tory or Labour? Oh, I think he'd probably... Oh, that's a very good question. I like that very much. Um, So Dickens, I think, would vote Labour. Um, Dickens, uh, he's a controversial figure now. People point out that some pretty peculiar stereotypes of minority ethnic groups, of Jews and others. Mm. But he was a man with an enormous, prodigious social conscience. He'd experienced real poverty and marginalisation. His father had been sent to jail. Um, he saw a lot of bits of Britain that other people didn't report. Um, so I think um, Charles Dickens would have been a Labour voter. And we, and we love him for that. T.S. Eliot, on the other hand, would have voted Conservative. And Lord Elgin? <laughs> Lord Elgin would certainly have voted Liberal. <laughs> and Lord Byron? Lord Byron would have voted, wouldn't have voted at all. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't have voted at all. Oh, he would have voted very much a pox on all their houses. Now, John... If you were a leader of a hypothetical third party that was about to win an election and could bring across one person from the Labour Party and one from the Conservatives, who would you choose? Why? And what cabinet position do you give them? So hold on, you got you see, so, you're so, like a Lib Demy type Lib thing. Lib Dem, and you a, get a, and that's right, Lib Dem, and you get or a restless like politics fant- centre fant- ground party. Yeah, exactly. Rest politics centre ground party, fantasy football. You get one Labour, one Conservative politician. I guess to to make it more difficult for us, they have to be people who are in Parliament at the moment. Okay. Uh, shall we go Peter Kyle? Peter Kyle, yes. I'm definitely taking Peter Kyle. Peter Kyle is the prodigiously talented and wonderful Labour lead on science and technology. Yeah, so let's go Peter Kyle. And then on the Tory side? Ooh, I've got... Well, you know, I'm beginning... I mean, this is a radical choice. I mean, not long ago, Gillian Keegan was... Gillian you Keegan, Prime Minister. Alex Chalk, Victoria Prentice, these are all people I admire. But I'm beginning to think that James Cleverly might have a future. And this is something that you had um, pointed out with Fiona. I'm hoping that the Conservative Party of the future is not going to tilt to a Swella Bravman, Pretty Patel right. I think Pretty Patel's in a bit of a prime position, etc. Do you think think Bravman's shot her bolt? I think she may have shot her bolt. And Pretty Patel has not. I think Pretty Patel is the entry drug to the what about the man, what about the man Nigel the, Farage. What about the man in the jungle losing lots of viewers? Well, that's what I think Pretty Patel is, is the entry drug to. And I think they'll all be asked in the leadership election to commit to whether they bring Farage back. And I think one of them, I think the party will lurch to the right. They won't learn, learn the lesson. One of them will bring Farage back and Farage will then eat them from the inside. And that'll be the end of the Conservative Party. Mm. Happy days. Do you, um, and yeah, James Cleverly, you don't think shithole gate has damaged him? Well, I think he would, it would really help if he didn't say the word shit, um, a you know, a lot. Bat shit. What yeah. was bat? The Randall plan was bat shit. Yeah. But on and the, but, Stockton or but, the MP yeah. was, was a shithole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not good, is it? No, not good. Not good. Not it's good. funny. If, I, you can get, if you can get a grip on that, though, I think he's actually, I think his civil servants really liked him. People in the foreign office like him. I think the home office loved his first speech that he made when he arrived. He's somebody who I try to persuade him to um, run as my kind of running mate when I was running for leadership because I've always thought that he's he's a kind of real person. He was a um, territorial army officer for 20 years. He's relaxed. He's a bit detached from politics. He's quite blokey. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good friend to people. I'm just looking down the front bench now. There's nobody springing out at me. Um, I think, yeah, I, funny enough, until recent days, and I did think Yvette Cooper gave him an absolute battering yesterday in the Commons, but I think, yeah, I can see cleverly emerging in a in a different light. Very good. Okay, now this is the old chestnut that keeps coming back, but it does relate to what we're just talking about. Do you think it's, Matt Holden, do you think it's genuinely possible for a new political party to emerge and challenge the status quo how much funding would this kind of enterprise need? I think the, I'll try first. I think just following off what I was saying about Pretty Patel and Nigel Farage, I think the obvious opportunity is if the Conservatives make the catastrophic error of lurching further to the right after losing the next election, then I think there is space. But that will also depend on how the Labour Party performs in power. But it's difficult, very, very difficult in a first-party It's so difficult. And, and the question of funding, I mean, 
I, I don't know how this happened and, and why it didn't seem to me to get any debate at all. The Conservatives have sort of unilaterally doubled the amount of funding that you can spend in the general election. Um, now, whether they're worried about Labour getting more money in, I don't know. But so you're now, they've now doubled it. So they're going to be presumably spending even more on kind of social media dark arts and all that stuff. Um, so it would well, be... that's 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 very sad. I haven't yeah. followed that. That's very yeah. sad. I, I think one of the really good I think things it was a Michael Gove thing. Well, one of the really good things about Britain at a constituency level is we have these very strict limits yeah. on constituency spending. Well, we should we should maybe check it out and talk about it next week. Yeah, because yeah. I I I, th I think it's a it's one of those things that. I think I saw sort of six paragraphs in the Financial oh, Times or no, something. Let's, let's do more on that. So no, I think it's very. I think the combination of our electoral system, our media, our and also these funding rules, I think it make it very, very, very hard. I, I, I where I disagree with you. I think if Labour didn't win the next election, uh, that's where people start to think. I mean, for God's sake, you know, if they if you can't have an opposition to beat this lot, then our entire politics is absolutely F-U-C-K'd. And therefore, that may be something emerges. But it always takes, it takes leaders, it takes money, it takes momentum. Um, but I can't, I just think the electoral system is the thing that's got to change. And there's no sign yet of a party that can get anywhere close to government that is committed to changing the electoral system. By the way, that isn't the same thing as saying that you couldn't do that. Um, and, and just on that, by the way, um, I don't know if you. I think I sent you the clip of John Curtis on on Brexit. Yeah. Did I send you that? Yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Well, no, it's just remarkable that, and it's kind of what I've been saying for years. But the the the, the people who didn't vote Labour because of Brexit, many of them have now turned against Brexit. So that kind of has moved removed um, one of the barriers to them voting for it. The people who voted Labour are now more anti-Brexit than they were, and young people are profoundly anti-Brexit. So the point he was making is that Labour's always been strategizing around the belief that there's nothing that there's no politics around Brexit that can put the Labour Party in a position different to the government, but this becomes a winning position. And he said that is profoundly wrong. Another thing I picked up at the okay, weekend. So, 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 sorry, the, the implications of that are that it should be possible for Labour to be bolder yeah. about Brexit, which yeah. you've been saying for a long time. Absolutely. And you actually see it, I think, as one of the big sort of political crusades, as it were, for the next decade, is yeah. trying to is trying to lead this conversation about at least coming close to the European Union, Absolutely. if not rejoining. Well, yeah. We, yeah. We're going to have to change. Look, yeah. And as we said in the, the discussion we had in the autumn statement, the OBR is still saying as a fact 4% of our economy and, has been hit. And reasons for that, just to remind people, are um, we've got more friction on trade with our biggest trading partner. The other trade deals are not really coming through. The lack of competition, which means from leaving this big single market, means that our productivity is going to decline. And inward investment has also been declining. Tell us a little bit about the trade deals, because you've been interested in that. Well, there was a, it, the other piece of news that came out in the OBR report, not announced by Jeremy Hunt, was that the great fanfare Trans-Pacific trade deal will add 0.04%. It's not a lot. To our GDP. 0.04 is not a lot. It's not a lot when you've no. lost 4%. No, no, not, not a great deal. I, I, the, the other thing I want to say about, about young people, I was at a conference at the weekend for an organisation called My Life, My Say, and they're, they're, they're launching this campaign basically around voter registration. What proportion of people aged 18 to 24 do you think are registered to vote? Ooh, I imagine it's surprisingly low and sad. It's yeah. 60%. So when these polls are done, I think there's a prior question which we need to ask people, are you registered to vote? And we need compulsory registration, and I'd obviously like compulsory voting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so question from Jemima. Is Joe Biden likely to beat Trump at the next election? And if not... Is it possible to get rid of Biden? I think it's only possible, I think get rid is a horrible phrase. I think the only way that's going to happen is if Joe Biden decides that he's had a pretty good run, an amazing life, an amazing career, but he understands why people are starting to talk more and more about his age. I think he's got a great record, but that doesn't really seem to be penetrating the, the debate. Would he beat Trump? I mean... <sighs> 
I, I was mildly encouraged by what Arnold Schwarzenegger said in this very studio when he said he felt these legal cases were going to drag Trump down. I, but, but of course, I worried that that was him equivocating and avoiding criticizing yeah, Trump, and yeah, saying it's just hypothetical. I won't answer the question. I mean, it is, we, you know, we talked a little bit about, we talked, in fact, we talked a lot on the main podcast about this whole sort of right wing stuff with Wilders and, and Millet, but Trump is the. He's the absolute outlier on it, isn't he? I mean, he's worse than any of them in terms of the things he says, the things he does. I don't think any of these other leaders would have survived quite how much scandal and opprobrium he has survived. Completely astonishing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Completely astonishing. And the way that he has lined up an entire generation now to get an endorsement to be a congressman or a senator with yeah. his backing, you basically have to buy into the big lie that the election was stolen. And the one thing you were saying about populism in Europe, we don't yet... We haven't yet had a defeated hard right leader or populist leader who's then disputed the election. The polls in the end did make way. Yeah. For, yeah. For yeah. The PIS did make way for yeah. Tusk. Um, so, but, you know, they'll be looking at America. Yeah. And if Trump comes back, people yeah. will start to think, well, and, do you know what? That's the way to and, behave. And just to remind people, Trump is doing better and better. Um, and the things that are really going to be worrying Biden are that African-American voters look as though they're turning against Biden. If there's a shift from even 10% voting for Trump to 20% voting for Trump, which seems plausible, that's going to have a huge impact. And what are the things that are hurting him? The things that are hurting him, I think, above all, is cost of living. Biden refuses to actually even talk about cost of living or acknowledge it. He just wants to talk about how well the American economy is doing. The American economy has been doing very well, much better than the European economies. You know, growth that would be eye-watering in the United Kingdom, but it has imposed real strains on people on minimal incomes. And very sadly, the child tax credits which were introduced, which made an enormous difference, $3,500 per child for low-income families in the US, were discontinued. Um, and I think people are really feeling that in their pockets. And African-American votes are being shifted by crime, African Americans now put crime as their number one issue that they're worried about. And Biden is not perceived as doing well on that. Immigration is a big issue. And you don't want to be going into an election against Trump if the biggest issues are crime, immigration, and cost of living. I must um, let you know, you, you, you'll find this, I hope, interesting, sort of amusing in a weird kind of way. It's Lachlan Murdoch's first week on the job at the top of the empire, the Murdoch empire. And somebody sent me some screen grabs of Fox News last night. Crossbred feral hogs invading America. <laughs> and then and next one, Canadian super pigs threatening America. <laughs> now, Roy, you shouldn't laugh. You shouldn't laugh because this is what they do. They get us to laugh. And then they basically sort of feed this idea that we're all being invaded. By super pigs. By super pigs. Penultimate for me. Sandy DeBorn, gambling, betting, resulting addiction. What's your personal experience with it? How should it be regulated, especially online betting? Well, I think one of the rare criticisms I make of the Labour government, I think we were too liberal. On, on gambling. On gambling. I, th I, I really don't like the fact that our sport is drowning in gambling advertising and sponsorship. And you feel it's it's a real addiction? I think gambling is an addiction. I think I think I think my brother Donald was probably a gambling addict. Um he and he didn't bet massively, but he bet a lot and quite often got into debt. Um yeah, I think I think there is something in gambling that that makes people feel the hit that you get. It's like drink, the hit that you get from the drink. Once once it's worn off, you want another one. And I and, and I think some of these uh, you know, every time I walk past those kind of, you know, these sort of one arm bandit what you call slot machine yep. places yep. and what have you, I just look in and I, I, I sort of, I don't know, I've, I've, I can see an addict in the people that are standing yep. there just pouring their money in. Even, and even when they know that the system is rigged against them. Yeah. So, so policy terms, cut down on advertising. I don't, look, we, we, we did it with, with tobacco yep. in um, tobacco sponsorship. Uh, alcohol sponsorship, and I think it should be the same with gambling sponsorship. I, th I think that it, it, th there is a reason why the companies do it, which is that it makes more people gamble. It's obvious. Yeah. 
And I think that, you know, I, I think we the, the, there's different levels of gambling, but I, I think that for a lot of people who don't have that much money, I think to spend a lot of that money on, on and I, I get the whole sort of people say, oh, you kill joy, whatever, yeah. you know, it's the one bit of fun we have, etc. But I just think there are so many people now who are in real distress because of gambling. Great. Last question to you. Final question. Why, this is from Emma, why are reform people like Isabel Oakeshott, people like Kate Andrews, ex of the in IEA, get so much airtime? Where are the Greens and the Lib Dems and all these panel debates? My criticism of the broadcast has always been that they allow the agenda to be shaped by the right wing press. And the reason these people get more airtime than people who frankly should do, if you're looking at the electoral map, is because they're, they're right wing and our media is basically right wing. So I, I, I think you're right. I, I got a lovely little note from a, uh, a journalist I loved called Craig Brown, who um, had been reading my book, Plug Politics on the Edge. And in it, he says one of the things that struck him is that it seems to be a culture of what he calls shock jocks, that the way in which Pretty Patel, Liz Truss and others promote themselves is basically just by being shocking. Mm. And we've created a sort of infantilized political culture. And this is maybe where the Lib Dems and the Greens are struggling. They're not succeeding. It's not just the right wing thing. They're also not succeeding in providing these sort of provocative, headline-grabbing, exciting things. I, I, I never could get my head around why Liz Truss was so popular with journalists because she didn't seem to me to be great at making public speeches. She wasn't particularly interested, I felt, in the details of governing the department. Do you think Trump welcomes her in recent endorsement, by the way? Well, you see, that's another sort of thing. What is she doing endorsing Trump? But I think it's part of the same thing, that that one of the reasons journalists liked her is that she was, in their terms, good company. She was indiscreet when she had dinner with him. It's part of the reason you like that awful man, Alan Clark, isn't it? That he was always good for gossip around the table, right? That, yeah, but I never thought he'd be leader of the Conservative Party, nor did he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well actually, he did briefly. There's no, an awful moment he, in his diary he, he, he where he convinced himself. He had a sort of fantasy, yeah. that he might, but no, he never seriously <laughs> thought that was going, going to happen. But the, you know, I, I actually did send a, a message to the, somebody at Question Time. I mean, we've got the autumn statement, okay? There are so many people in this country who really do understand the economy. Isabel Oakeshott is not among them. So... Why is she on that program yet again? But of course, the why was Nigel Farage on that program more than any person apart from Ken Clark? Isabel, of course, Williams? will be listening to this with a smile because, of course, the more we talk about her, the more it's relevant she is. It's why we tried to avoid <laughs> talking about the man in the jungle. But I am, I am sort of quite pleased that the ITV are seeing absolutely terrible ratings. Yes, but at the same time, he's obviously going to win. And he's obviously going to use that to try to get back into the Conservative Party. And Is he going to win? Destroy the Conservative. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, how does he work? I don't know well, how it works. Obviously, we're not going to bet after what we've just been talking about gambling. But yeah, he's obviously going to win. Is he? Well, I think he's going to win. You heard it here first. No. I, well, I, I mean, I, I've never put a bet on in my life, but, you know, being a prude. But I don't, I don't, I don't I think you're totally wrong about <laughs> right, that. Right. Well, let's see. OK, well, we, tr we, got, we almost got to the end without mentioning the man in the jungle. Oh, it's we failed. Right. See you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.